And do you call a guy a beauty digger because he's going to only go for a hot girl? If you want to learn about a woman quickly, find out what kind of juice she likes to drink. When powers like that are put upon you of that age, you're not prepared to handle them. You have a you psychological cracker. Today, smart girls marry money. That's what authors Elizabeth Ford and Dr. Daniela Drake say. And later in the show, PowerPoint comedian Tim Lee joins us. And then Darren Campo, head of programming at True TV, takes us on a sci-fi journey. But up first, Elizabeth Ford and Dr. Daniela Drake. Great to have you both here today. Oh, thanks, for Elizabeth. Us. Thanks Dr. For Drake. Us. So forget love and go for the money. Is that it? That's pretty much it. <laughs> <laughs> Well, the guys are going to love this. This is the show for the women today, I guess. So. Well, that's certainly the one line, but we're actually not saying that. We're saying that it's important to consider all things. Right now, most women say, all I want is to fall in love. I don't even care if he's got a job. I mean, what we hear from a lot of women is, I want a guy with a job and a car. They're not even wanting much more than that. They're really in love with love. And I think, we both think, it's gotten women into a lot of trouble. So we're sort of saying, take a step back and let's do, look at the whole picture. And the, and the title is meant to get your attention, obviously it does. It's meant to <laughs> it you know, be upsetting and you know, have people go, what, are you kidding me? Because it started out as sort of a joke between the two of us. Mm -hmm. Like, we're both professional women. We both work very hard and we have kids. And, and we're like, oh gosh, you know, we should have married for money so we could be kicking it right now. <laughs> and. In, instead, as we got into the research, we found out that women uh, have a really hard time out there. It's not so equal as we had thought in terms of earning potential and you know, a lot of factors added up to, to have a say, hey, you know what, this is worth talking about, this is worth discussing, and, and the title, you know. So you do think that there are some women who have, you know, as you've been advancing in your careers, you see the woman who stayed at home and married the guy and is doing better than the woman who's been working her ass off all these years. <laughs> well, it's true, and it's not so much, and we're not saying don't work, because we think that our work is part of who we are, and we love, you know, we want to be in in the world, you know, we don't want to be at home like both of us each say, you know, being the stay-at-home mom wouldn't be the best choice for us because we, we want to be in the world and, you know, have to Although go. we're not going to say it's not fulfilling for a lot of women, but in the end, your career is one of your biggest assets. And we certainly know that when marriages fall apart or should your partner die. So we're also saying it's really important to invest in your career. But it's also really important to invest in your marriage. Your marriage is the, probably the most important economic relationship you'll ever have in your life. So you're going back to the economics there again. Well, you know what? For most of human history, before the last 150 years, marriage was always based on economic and political expediencies. Right. It's really been in the last 150 years that love conquered marriage. Right, well, and really it's been a debate for a long time whether you should marry for love or money. And this is one of the few times or more memorable times recently I can think of where I just came out and said go well, for that's it. that's the thing is that people are afraid to even talk about it. I mean, people are just aghast that you would even consider any other thing but love as, as a reason to get married. But what we found in our research is that the actual love, the romantic love, peace is um, it's biochemical you know it acts on the same part of the brain that is the same as addiction obsessive thinking and that that feeling the crazy feeling that oh is he gonna call feeling only lasts about two years so if you're gonna base a lifetime partnership on this sort of madness of love I mean the, we looked at each other and said, you know, there's a lot of other things that you could, you should consider, and economics should be part of that piece, especially if you're planning a lifetime commitment, a lifelong partnership. You know, it should be more than just, you know, being crazy in love. So, for the the, the gold digger portion of it, how how common is that? Do you think these days? You know, for us, because we were always professional, it never even crossed our minds. We were brought up, raised on the idea that we were going to be professional women. We're very much in, brought up by feminist mothers and in a feminist mindset. And, but we also wanted that love piece because we were also raised on that. Um, it never even occurred to us throughout most of our adult lives that you should marry for any other reason than for love. In fact, I got out of my Did you read this book? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> That's not what the authors of this book but, say. Uh, no, that's actually not true. We do say, you know, love is important. But we say that, you know, romantic love is something other than that long-lasting love, the partnership love. Romantic love is a madness that falls away, and studies have shown that now. Um, we're saying, look at the whole piece. We don't think we would have gotten anybody's attention if we'd named the book Don't Marry a Slacker. I mean, everybody really knows that, yeah. right? <laughs> 
But I think, though, whether it's just guys or people in general, though, do think there's a difference between men and women in the extent that maybe women do look more for money in, in the marriage, or at least that's a stereotype or in the relationship, whereas guys are probably focused more on looks or whatever. And do you think that's true? Say. I mean, do you call a guy a beauty digger because he's going to only go for a hot girl? I mean, I think our society signs off on, you know, um, everything from plastic surgery and you know working out looking a certain way that that's valuable but then to to say that a woman then values a man's earning potential it suddenly becomes crass i'm like that doesn't really make sense to me because i think that if being young and beautiful is worth something then you know it's worth something i think that's what our book is talking about it's like you know which is why is it why is one crass and the other not you know, why can't we at least talk about it? And to put it a little crassly, I guess you said to use it before you lose it, right? Absolutely. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's certainly true. It's been a lifelong thing that, I mean, we're sort of a, a human history long, that men want women for their fertility. And we all know that women, when they're young, are very attractive to well, pretty much all men. And as they age, they're less attractive to pretty much all men. Not that, that there aren't men that are interested, aren't interested in 40-year-old women. But um, the reality is, is that a lot of young women still think they have so much time to make mistakes, to make errors, to fall in love with the wrong guy. And when they wake up at 35 or 40, find that they've sacrificed their careers and they can no longer get back on track. And they may be thrown over for a younger woman and they're no longer as marketable on the marriage market. And so those are some of the realities that women don't think about. And we're just sort of saying, let's wake up and talk about some of this stuff because it's really important. In the end, it's women that dis disproportionately end up in poverty. And that's what we're At the end of about. a marriage. And well, based on your own careers, um, I mean, do you feel, though, that it's true that women are still, I mean, obviously, statistically, it's true at the high levels that, you know, guys in many positions are still more dominant, although at the lower levels, women are working their way up and it's becoming more equal at the bottom, and maybe that'll play out over time. But you think there's even a more subtle thing that, uh, just because of the feeling that maybe the woman will get pregnant or leave or something. I mean, do you think there's still more baggage for, um, for women in well, general? It's, it's just not that... so much baggage. It's just that we do live our lives differently. You know, we do want to take time off to take care of our kids. I mean, like, we, we both of us loved our careers, but when we had children, we wanted to take time off to be with our babies and, you know, how much time can we take off? And, and, and did that, your employers understand that? Not really. I mean, you know, who, who, would, who would? I mean, if it's, it, you know, my ex didn't, my husband didn't take time off during that time. You know, it's like he's, he was committed to his job. And I think that, you know, women do tend to be, whether it's taking care of your parents or taking care of your children, like we tend to, to put our careers aside a little bit here and there throughout our, our career path. And overall, it ends up that we end up earning one third the amount of, that men do over their lifetime. And that, that's just like, when we saw those statistics, both of us were like, are you kidding? But then again, both of us did take time off, you know, and we know women who all are trying to take time off to do these other things because we're not only focused on the one, the one path, the one career path. Well, I guess then, as you quote in the book, that grandma says that it's just as easy to fall in love with a rich guy as a poor guy. Is that the, what we'll take away from this? <laughs> <laughs> well, thank you both very much, Elizabeth Ford, Dr. Drake. Yes, the thank book you is so much Smart for Girls you. Marry Money. My pleasure. We'll be right back. Uh, just like the sodium and chlorine uh, molecule, an athlete and his wife are very strongly bonded when they're in the minor leagues. Uh, when the athlete signs that major league contract, uh, he's thrown into a sea of bimbos and money. The bimbos will actually work in concert to uh, separate the athlete from his wife. At that point, the wife becomes strongly attracted to the money. And we are back. Joining me now is Tim Lee, the PowerPoint comedian. Great to have you here today, Tim. Thanks for having me, Greg. So I want you to know I've experienced death by PowerPoint, but oh. I never really thought of PowerPoint <laughs> as comedy before. Yeah, I think everyone's been through death by PowerPoint. You know, <laughs> Isn't that awful? You go into one of those conference rooms and they pull up like a 50-page PowerPoint. Yeah, and they bore you to death. And yeah. some bosses really get off on that. Like, yeah. you got to have these 50-page PowerPoints that are... Yeah, it's gruesome. <laughs> it's gruesome. I've been there. And I had to, that's kind of what I started with. You know, I, I started doing my first jokes when I was giving uh, seminars in grad school. So I, oh. I'd throw in a PowerPoint joke into a, a 
what otherwise would be a boring seminar. Humor always helps a PowerPoint yeah. presentation. And now you've taken this to an art form, to comedy, pure comedy. Yeah, now it's pure comedy. And yeah. mixed in science, of all things, and biology. Yeah, that's kind of my background, you know? So uh, I always wanted to do jokes about uh, science, all fields, but a lot of it's biology. And uh, so, you know, the PowerPoint, I've been doing it during seminars anyway. So you start, you're working on your PhD in biology at UC Davis? Yeah. And that's when you started. Because you don't often think of ecology and evolution as being the source of, if you go to the comedy store, you don't hear many biology jokes these days. No, you don't. But you used to hear a lot of Star Trek jokes. That's about oh. <laughs> as close as it is. Are you a Star, Star Trek fan? Uh, yeah, of course. Growing up, I loved Star Trek, uh, all kinds of science fiction, uh, Star Wars, anything. Yeah. But you know your videos have been very popular on YouTube. You're getting hundreds of thousands of hits on those videos. Yeah, that's been kind of my boon. Is uh, like started taking off on YouTube, and then people started noticing it, so I took it on the road, and uh, it's really just built the audience sort of in a, a natural, granular fashion. So it's, it's been a lot of fun. But one thing I did learn today that, from that last. Uh, Oh, you can incorporate this into your <laughs> material now, right? I'm going to have to keep that book out of my girlfriend's hands. That's all i got to say. Uh, yeah, I thought they pulled back a little bit. You know, if you read that book, I'm telling you, they say go for the money. Oh, uh, really? <laughs> yeah. They were putting a little nicer spit on it here at the studio. But if you read that book, point they, in my uh, life, I'd be happy to have enough money that I could do all of my shopping at Whole Foods. <laughs> <laughs> well, you can always marry for money, too. But, you know, it, it works both ways. Nice, so. I could try, yes. <laughs> Actually, you know, I didn't tell them this, but um, they say that the heir, to, one of the heirs to the Walmart fortune woman, um, had a problem whenever she went on a date because the guys on the first date would tell her that they were in love with her. Oh, uh, really? <laughs> and she knew that there was no way that they were actually in love with her on the first date, that it was more like they were in love with the $20 billion that she owed at Walmart, yeah. you know? They got to get a better game than that. You can't. <laughs> yeah, I know. <laughs> first date. No. And guys with money are onto that, too, right? They know when, uh, so. It's kind of funny. But I guess, but sometimes, you know, with guys, what do you think? I mean, as far as trophy wives, I mean, I guess guys are, think it's okay. Or, I mean, they know. Well, yeah, they're, they're uh, kind of looking for those kind of women sometimes. The, the problem with the trophy wife is that it doesn't come with a trophy personality. And so you end up living with the, the shell gets But gets I guess old. some, but I think some guys don't care is the thing. Yeah, they don't care. But generally, those aren't the type of guys that... You know, well, so you have a PhD in biology, though. Yeah, <laughs> PhD in biology. So yeah. you want somebody who can tell ecology and evolution jokes, you know? So <laughs> uh, that would be nice. As long as she can laugh at my jokes at this point, that's uh, that, that would be fine with me. Yeah. And what kind of? I mean, do you have a very specific audience, or do you really get? almost anybody coming to these. I mean, because they're funny when you watch the videos, but do most people think, oh my god, it's biology, I'm going to... Uh, no, it's pretty... Uh, well, I find that my audience is um, generally very intellectually curious. They're mm -hmm. people um, that like... And they're well-read and... Um, For those Darwin jokes. And Darwin, <laughs> any kind of joke. <laughs> but I, 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 the thing is, I try and make it so that you can, from the setup of the joke, you can get the punchline. So you don't have to know about you know signal to noise ratios to get the joke about signal to noise ratio. I just explain to you what it is, and then you can get the joke about it afterwards. That's kind of a lot of where it comes from. But uh, yeah, the people who come to my my show, they want to learn something. A lot of them mm -hmm. while they're laughing, and uh, so I get I do well in theaters and places where people like to go see. Uh, uh, well, I liked your comment about Larry King when he started his first talk show. Oh uh, yeah. Like, <laughs> 50 million years ago. <laughs> That's in my... Uh, and then his first wife was... <laughs> yeah, he goes for the trophy wives. That's right. And, uh, <laughs> you had to watch the video, okay, <laughs> I have to admit. So do you have any thoughts on dating and relationships and other than we were talking about the financial side of it, but just... Um, well, um... I know you don't have your PowerPoint here, yeah, so I'm putting you on I've the had, spot. I've got a lot of... Uh, yeah, well, for those women, uh, if you really are looking for a man with money, I'll tell you this, don't go after the guy with the BMW because it's mm. probably leased. Uh, you want to find a guy with a, <laughs> a lot of money. You go to Whole Foods, you look for a guy with a full basket. <laughs> Can't get financing on organic cheese. Oh. So that's the tip for finding a guy with money. Now, uh, but I have learned a lot about women. I'm actually fairly recently out of a, a two-year uh, relationship. Uh, it was an open relationship. I didn't know it was an open relationship. <laughs> I was gonna, yeah, I was going to say I was sorry, but I figured this was leading somewhere. So I, uh... <laughs> uh, but I did learn something important. If you want to learn about a woman quickly, find out what kind of juice she likes to drink. Well, what's that? She's into apple juice. She's going to be a homey woman. 
probably a good cook. If she's into orange juice. Did you say homely or homey? Homey. Okay. <laughs> you don't even know what kind of juice she drinks to know what she looks like. <laughs> okay, yeah, fair enough. She's into orange juice, she can be a little more outdoorsy, a little more zesty. Hmm. She's into cranberry juice, uh, she's got a urinary tract infection. <laughs> Cut that date short. <laughs> Okay. <laughs> but you know, that's your biology coming in handy there, folks. <laughs> Do you agree with that, John? <laughs> but you know, actually, I was thinking when you said about the grocery store, that makes sense in a way because I noticed before, well, actually, I guess I don't go to the grocery store that often anymore, but, but when I did, um, I always thought there was something going on in that grocery store in Santa Monica because people were kind of like prowling the aisles of the grocery store. In Whole Foods? Actually, this was pavilions. Oh, okay. Yeah, I mean, it's yeah. great. I guess people like to meet. I guess what I'm saying is the grocery store was a meat market. Yeah, literally. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, but I, I just wasn't paying attention to whose cart was full or not. I guess that's yeah, the problem. Yeah, that's what I'm saying. Uh, that's what I thought. Because, you know, I thought about that a lot. Because my friends who, I don't have a lot of money, but my friends who do have a lot of money, they try to hide it generally so that they don't attract the kind of Oh, so, that, so they're, the yeah. they're wise to it. And then I noticed in Whole Foods, I'm like, it's easy to tell he's got money. This guy's putting like 10 pounds of organic cheese in his car. He's spending $300 on cheese. This guy's got money. Ladies could figure it out real quickly in here. So That's, that's why the Whole Food parking lot is always jam-packed. There's <laughs> <laughs> enough plugs for Whole Foods, huh? Yeah, yeah. Well, actually, they should be one of our sponsors now, I think. But uh, yeah. so, um, uh, what have you got coming up anytime soon here in town, here oh, in LA? Um, in LA, uh, August twentieth, I'll be in the Hermosa Beach Playhouse, um, and then I'm doing next week. I'll be in San Diego. I'll be doing the Carlsbad Village Theater, uh, shows and shows, which is in Lemon Grove, and then I'll do the Coronado Playhouse. Okay, that's all you get. That's all enough right. of a plug. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you very much, Tim Thank Lee, the you. PowerPoint comedian. You can check him out on YouTube. Up next, Darren Campo from True TV. We'll be right back. <laughs> And we are back. Joining me now is Darren Campo, head of programming at True TV. He's author of the upcoming book, Alex Details Revolution. Pleasure to have you here today, Darren. Thank you very much. So I thought it was very interesting because you think of True TV as reality TV or non-scripted programming, but you've written a sci-fi book of all things, which is very much scripted. That's right. Well, when you think of stories, you know, they take, they take all forms. And the earliest stories really were that were written down and formed by real life. And uh, it's amazing to me, you can go back in time 5,000 years ago and read the Upanishads, which are Hindu texts, and oh. find stories of people who are asking themselves, why am I here? What am I doing here? And then there are, they engage in life, and they engage in a story of good versus evil, and there are hoped for outcomes and feared outcomes, and it's just the same thing we have today. Okay, so truthfully, I wasn't just impressed that you wrote the book, but the fact that you just quoted like ancient Indian texts for a development executive in Hollywood, no offense, but I was actually impressed by that because I thought, my God, this guy's actually read. And you quoted Schopenhauer and, and Nietzsche and various philosophers, and you know, you don't always think that it goes that deep in Hollywood, pardon my saying it. Well, but. you know, maybe it's because I wrote the book before I actually uh, became <laughs> got TV sucked executive. In, huh? so. But, so was that an asset or a hindrance then to have that kind of a intellectual background, if I may say it for, you know, for... You know, um, when you are uh, of a certain age and very much engaged in something as I was when I was writing this, and I was uh, reading a lot of uh, Schopenhauer and Joseph Campbell, and I was very much into physics, and I had these characters who I wanted to sort of set off on this adventure, and they're on this adventure to Pluto to save the world. Mm. Um, uh, it's freeing, but as I became more, you know, more of a television producer and uh, learned more about story structure, I was able to go back and say, you know, I have all of the content in this book, but let me just rearrange some things and rewrite some things. Mm. And I have a lot so, of help. So you've been continuously kind of rewriting it over the years. Well, so it's, it, I, it was a three years of to research and write the book and uh, 10 years to actually get it to where, uh, wow. where uh, it's been published. A little bit different from TV, though, where you just have to kind of crank it out, right? Yeah, I wanted it on the air yesterday. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Right. More like uh, making a movie, huh? So, a 10-year development process yeah, yeah. or something. Exactly. So you're a big sci-fi fan? I, I am a big sci-fi fan. I think it's a, uh, a wonderful thing. Uh, you see it re-emerging a lot now. Um, what people are really looking for in their entertainment um, are not just, um, it's sort of like being swept up into a great story, which is the first thing any good piece of entertainment has to do, whether it's a movie or a book or a play, etc. 
But then, if there are characters that inform you and, and make you more aware of the mystery of your own life, uh -huh. and the things, it speaks to you. And science fiction pitches you out of this world that we're in now, with sort of the temporal concerns of economics and paying bills, right. and can put you somewhere else where you can have an experience um, uh, that, that can help you and inform you in, in your day-to-day -day life. Did you see the new Star Trek movie? I did. Did you like that? I really did like it a lot. I think what they're playing with there, um, um, I, I think Gene Roddenberry created something that lasts to this day because he took the local form that we're in, which is the United States and all of our, you know, sort of, we're very rational and science-based for the most part, and, um, and then you see the Vulcans um, and the Romulans and the Klingons and the Vulcans, you say, my God, that's Zen Buddhism that mm. they're practicing. They're detaching themselves from their emotions and living on logic. Um, so he's really created a model of our world today um, into the cosmos in the future. So it's really fantastic. Right, and again, I mean, you can say it's just sci-fi, but as you said, I mean, any good story, if you really dig deeper, there really are bigger you themes. You will find that are... very similar themes, um, and one of them is sort of the inciting incident of this book. The main character is Alex Detail. Now, there was, it takes place 250 years from now, now there was a big war. These big ships showed up and they were just extinguishing the sun and this was a terrible problem, yeah, like obviously. Harvesting the sun or stealing harvesting it or something? The sun, yeah. So we called them the harvesters in the book. Um, now, things weren't looking too good, but this seven-year-old comes up with this niche, and he's a genius. Hmm. And uh, the military gets wind of this and they sweep him up and they use him to, and he effectively is the person who wins the war for them. Uh, and now, the book opens 10 years later. Now, when powers like that are put upon you of that age, you're not prepared to handle them. You have a you psychological crack-up. So, like a child star kind of thing. Exactly. Like a child star. <laughs> Save the universe at age seven, you know. That, that puts some pressure exactly. on you. Exactly. So the question is, how are you going to deal with this thing? Well, when we open on the book, we find out that Alex Detail is no longer that mega genius he was seven, at mm. seven years old. Now he's 17. And um, he's developed some, some interesting psychological conditions. Mm -hmm. And he's not interested to go out and fight this war again because the harvesters have come back and they need him again. So what do they do? Naturally, it's a government. They kidnap him, oh. put him on a ship, and he wakes up and the ship is about to be destroyed. So what choice do you have? Now, his character is a little bit based on you? Are part of it in the sense that you said, like when you were younger, that I read in your bio that you, um, or when we were talking, that you, you used to play the piano, right. right? And you were pretty good at it. I was very good at it, and um, whether it was something genetically that, as I got older, it just, just wasn't as easy, or it was because I got involved in other things. But by the time college was over, I said, "My God, this skill is gone." So you and felt then, like kind of because you hear that sometimes, like in mathematics or music, that again that that it does peak at a young age and then people... Well, what happens so. is, you know, there's this great thing uh, uh, I read once, which uh, is uh, philosophy says never fight the last war. Hmm. Because you might have won, won the last war, but then everyone who saw how you won it, they're, they're going to uh, assume that's what you're going to do. You might have lost the last war. Um, but if you just keep doing the same thing over and over, you're not really progressing very far. So... Um, I think that's something that happens when, when you have this motif, for instance, Alex Detail. As a seven-year-old, mind opens up, and then society requires he perform. Hmm. Mind closes down. Hmm. So just a lot of stress on him. So, well, they stick him on a ship that they need to get out to Pluto, so he has got to perform, and that mind opens right back up because there's one thing he doesn't want, and he doesn't want to die. Uh, so what are your plans for the book? Um, it's coming out this fall, I believe. It'll be published this fall. It'll be, it's available on Amazon right now if you want to pre-order it. Um, and uh, it'll be available in, in, uh, in hardcover and then paperback. Well, you know, I, since you're a development executive, I couldn't help thinking when I was reading the book, I thought, I wonder if he's going to make this into a TV show or a movie or any thoughts along that line? Well, you know, it's, I think, have a, you know, you write a book um, and it's almost like having a child that sort of goes out in the world and uh, you have to let it go. I think J.K. Rowling, uh, you know, she said, here we go, Warner Brothers, and, uh, and then they went. Well, yeah, <laughs> that'd be a nice path to follow, right? <laughs> here you go, Warner Brothers. <laughs> here you go, Warner Brothers. <laughs> well, thank you very much, Darren Campo from True TV. The book is Alex Details Revolution. Look for it this fall. Thanks, everybody, for watching. We'll see you next time.